So let me set the stage for a virtual wildflower walk. Here is a forest in early spring. And notice that the trees hadn't, haven't fully leafed out, that the sun is able to reach the forest floor. So this is a critical moment now for a forest. So the sun is bathing the floor, it's warming it up, certainly thawing it out, right? Especially from the February we had. But there's only a few weeks now where uh, the sun will actually be able to get through the forest floor. And then um, what happens then, of course, is the trees fully leaf out and the sunlight can no longer penetrate and it can't get through. So there's a big change in a forest from early spring to late spring and summer. So essentially what happens is that there's a large number of ephemeral wildflowers, spring ephemerals, and they're ephemeral because they have a narrow window of opportunity to take care of business. The sun hits the floor, the forest floor, these, these spring wildflowers pop up and their job is to photosynthesize, to turn that sunlight into sugar, turn that sugar into starch and get it down into the root again. And they're racing the trees leafing out. So you've got this race between the trees who are opening up and the flowers that need to take care of business. And not only do they need to photosynthesize, they also need to flower and produce their fruit. So flowers, these flowers have uh, a lot of responsibility in a very short window of time. And so uh, we're gonna meet the characters in this race against the trees. And then an, one other piece as a setup is what I call the crocus strategy. Uh, you've seen crocuses. In fact, we're actually done with crocuses pretty much, uh, depending on where you are. If it's a crocus on a south facing slope that gets full sun, it's probably finished already. Um, there's a cro few crocuses in, on my front lawn that are um, still still happy and in bloom. But look at that, look at that honeybee on top of it. I don't think you can call bees happy, but I'm sure that bee is on that. Think about that bee's life. Honeybees are cooped up in a hive for the entire winter. Um, you've probably seen March of the Penguins all those years ago where all the penguins huddle for warmth, keeping that egg um, the, 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 on the male's foot, right? keeping that egg warm uh, and they cluster and they stay warm. Bees do the same thing, except at the middle of the cluster is the queen. Um, so they're all clustered together and there's a die off during winter, which is hard for bees. Bees make honey, not for us, but they make honey for them to survive the winter. So bees make honey to get through the winter. Um, and so when it's a finally a warm day in spring, they can't wait to bust out. And so if you're a crocus on those first, and you're open on those first warm days of spring, the cool thing is you are ahead of everybody else. You're the only game in town. So you're going to get high visitation, high probability that you're going to get pollinated because you've got no competition but you're the first one to stick your neck out, literally, right? They're sticking their neck out of the ground and blossoming. And the day after they blossom, there could be six inches of snow. There could be an ice storm. Um, so it's high risk, but high reward. And it works enough years that this is the, the direction that crocuses have evolved. So crocuses are doing this high risk, high reward game uh, where they're praying that they can uh, beat whatever winter gives them. So you've got that strategy going on at the same time that you've got this race um, against the leaves popping out. And um, so not only is it a race, but it's also a parade so that you've got a parade of wildflowers that come up in sequence. And once upon a time, people could map that sequence and knew what week to expect what flower, but with the climate weirding, um, things are getting out of sequence and not sure if the parade, the parade is not quite as choreographed as well as it used to be. Some years it's different than others, but nonetheless, uh, there is a parade of wildflowers. So we're also going to be alluding to that, like who's early and who's late in the parade. So there's a croaker strategy and then the race. So there's three different sites when you go to the Schuylkill Center uh, to see wildflowers. Uh, there's two big collections of them. We're gonna visit what we call the wildflower loop down over here. And then we're gonna walk down ravine loop and it's this stretch of ravine loop. But right at the front door of the visitor center, uh, right before you go anywhere else, uh, right um, in front of the cisterns. So actually, if you go out 
if you walk out from the gift shop on your left is a magnolia tree under that magnolia tree you might see this bright white flower such a happy thing to see when it's spring and you've not seen a flower yet maybe you've seen crocuses but you haven't seen much else and you got this bright white flower with these impossibly yellow stamens just a great knockout combination right um and so, um, and what I'm going to do with all these slides is I'm going to give you a, um, I'm going to show you a picture first, and then I'll give you the name in a second, because um, we like to compartmentalize things. Uh, and so when we know the name of something, we often move on, we're done thinking, okay, I know that I'm going to move on to the next thing. So I'm not going to give you the name at first. So I'm gonna, it's a bit of a tease. I apologize for that. Uh, so some of you may know this flower very, very early in the parade, one of the first in the parade and it is bloodroot, as some of you might know. So there's a bloodroot um, that's been in bloom. Hmm, bloodroot, that's an interesting name, right? Uh, not named for the flower color, that's for sure. Um, but bright white flower, really early. Bloodroot uh, is the, is the, um, the name. Um, and here's the scientific name, sanguinaria. Sanguinaria canadensis. Canadensis is a name you see a lot. Uh, it just means it's from Canada. So um, <laughs> um, looks like Alice is doing some drawing on here. I don't know, Alice, if you could not do that, that would be really wonderful. <laughs> uh, I don't know how we all see that, but anyway, I, I don't know if all you can see this, but I'm seeing some drawing on my screen. All right, thank you, Alice. Um, sanguinaria means bloody. If somebody is sanguine, their blood is calm, uh, bloody, sanguine. So here's the bloody Canadian. Uh, what's the bloody part of this? If you pull up uh, blood root and look at the roots, um, you see this. So you cut, slice through the root and you see that bright red. Um, and that bright red uh, is a really remarkable color. And you can take that and put it in water and make kind of a mash um, and the Lenape and other people could use it as um, like paint to paint their faces. So um, one of its nicknames is Indian paint, um, which is uh, likely not a nickname that the Lenape gave it. It's likely a nickname that the settlers, the colonial settlers gave to the plant. Um, but there it is, um, blood root with that, that amazingly red root. The leaves are also noticeable. So once the flower is done flowering, you get these very circular leaves, these beautiful cutouts in them. Really, really handsome, striking leaves. Um, memorable, noticeable. So you'll find those too. And after the, uh, there's the leaf right there. And in front of that big leaf in the center, you see the seed pod. The seed pods are also easy to spot. So the flower, you know, one of the challenges of spring wildflowers is they're only up for a short window of time, each species is walking in the parade for only a, a short period of time and then it's done. So um, what, um, what happens is, well, look, actually look at that blood root on the left. You can see here the petals down here in the ground, right? And so the flower has now turned into a seed, which is really important. Uh, this is the job of the flower is to make fruit. So it's done its job, but this sort of spear uh, this vertical spear coming out in front of the colt's foot's round leaf. Uh, just a real, it's, a, it's also itself is a, is a very pretty sight, but that's, you know, oftentimes you'll see that on a walk and you'll go, darn, I missed, I missed the bright white petals when they bloomed because I wasn't here last week to see that. But now I want to call your attention on the right. Check out the seeds. Now, okay, there's those brown seeds. Those are the, you know, obvious cool seeds that, you know, you expect there. But look at those funny little white things attached to them. So it turns out that those white things look like little like larvae of insects maybe. Um, they're not, but um, they're collections of like fats and lipids and oils. So this has a fancy name, eliasome. Uh, scientists love to give things fancy names, but here's the eliasome. The E-L-A-I-O part of it uh, is a fancy Greek or Latin root that means oily, oils. So it's got those oils. The eliasome has these oils that actually the seed doesn't need to sprout. The flower makes the eliasomes. And again, remember that uh, flowers and insects 
have now co-evolved for you know, more than 100 million years. So they've worked out some interesting relationships. So the eliosome, and many wildflowers will make an eliosome, is this fatty thing stuck to the top of the seed to attract ants. Because ants cannot resist the eliosome. It's like ice cream. It's candy. It's pizza. It's beer to them. They love an eliosome. So they will carry the blood root seed away with eliosome. They'll take it into the colony, into the nest, into the anthill. They'll take it underground and they'll nibble on the eliosome. They'll all eat the eliosome, eat the fats and lipids of that because animals need that kind of uh, fats are what really fuel so many cells. They'll eat that and then they'll bring the seed to um, the section of the anthill for waste products. It's like the garbage dump, but the garbage dump of an ant mound is of course this nutrient rich environment with decomposing plants and things of all kinds. So the seed essentially is underground and it's put in this great spot where there's lots of nutrients. So blood root seduces the ant to carry its seed underground. So the ant does the work of burying it so you get more blood root. It's just a brilliant relationship that the two of them have worked out over many, many years. And in fact, there's a large number of plants who do that. So here's another wonderful word that you can practice many times if you wanna say it, but it's just a great word. The first half of it simply means ant. There's lots of ants with that root, uh, M-Y-R-M-E in front of them. And the second one, the second piece of it, the tail end of it is, means going in circles. So I think that uh, ants go in circles when they see this eliasome, uh, but ants are, so the flower is practicing myrmecockery, myrmecockery, which is the relationship of ants to flowers so that um, ants will essentially take, carry the seed away and plant it underground. And so myrmecockery happens with a surprising number of flowers, including a few more that we're gonna see tonight. So there's the blood root um, being planted by ants. Uh, many of these wildflowers have many common names. That's the beauty of the scientific name. I tend to stay away from scientific names because they're so hard to say. I love teaching the common names just so at least we have a name that we can say and we can call it. Uh, but I love to look at common names that it's been called over the years because it gives you other signals uh, about the plant. So this one is snake bite and sweet slumber. So wait, snake bite? and sweet slumber. So for me, there begins to be hints of a medicinal use for blood root. And so poking around online, uh, it's not hard to discover what the many things were that blood root was used for. Actually, it's used to cause a wide number of things. So in the root itself, that red chemical has a lot of stuff in it. And plants put things in, put chemicals in leaves and roots and flowers to um, prevent herbivores from nibbling on them. But it turns out that those things are very active biologically in us too. It's really remarkable. Um, and of course, um, the Lenape uh, who were here for perhaps as many as 10,000 years, lots of discussion about how, how long the Lenape were in Pennsylvania. They would have figured this all out uh, a long, long time ago and were gracious enough to teach a lot of it to the colonial settlers who were coming in soon after they're, you know, coming in after them. So, um, so blood root is used for a number of things, vomiting, to empty the bowels, to reduce tooth pain, croup, laryngitis, sore throat, poor, poor circulation, nasal polyps, rheumatism, warts, and fever. Um, it actually also helped remove dead tissue and promote healing from wounds. Um, and it was used to treat breast tumors. So there's a sort of a, an anti-carcinogenic power to blood root as well. So blood root was having a lot of uses in dentistry. Uh, it even became used uh, to, to help with plaque. So powerful stuff in a blood root um, with lots of medicinal uses. So that's the, the big wildflower that you can see right at the visitor center front door, uh, blood root. And now you know way too much about it. But what we're gonna do is walk down uh, our ravine loop. And the ravine loop is the dark purple one. You can get this map at our front door. Um, th this is the big loop right here. You walk through our meadow, the butterfly meadow. Um, and then you can go through the wildflower loop to get here, or you can go right down the ravine loop. And as you walk the ravine loop, you're gonna go downhill for a stretch. 
And then you're going to turn left at a stream that's Smith Run. When you turn left at Smith Run, right there, right there, uh, actually at the bottom of uh, the ravine loop at Smith Run, it's very muddy. We've had a lot of water this winter. It's a very active, very high water table. So it's pretty mushy gushy. So put on your boots as you walk or, or wear hiking boots. Um, but when you turn left, you're going to see our next wildflower. And this is one of my favorites. My, only because for me, this is my first sign of spring. So it comes up just a little before the bloodroot. Bloodroot's early. Um, this one is early er, and it's got that purple hood. And I'll show you a picture of the flowers tucked inside it um, in a second. But that, that purple hood is really noticeable, really remarkable, really fun to see. I'm really grateful to see it because then I know the rest of spring is about to come when I see this, because this can be up as early as late February. And many of you probably know this skunk cabbage. These are not yet the leaves of the skunk cabbage. This hood is the reproductive part of uh, the skunk cabbage, which comes up first. The leaves are those big, bright green cabbagey leaves that can be several feet tall uh, that you'll find in the summer. Uh, that do smell skunky. When you're a kid, you probably played with those. Um, but nonetheless, there's, there's our skunk cabbage leaves. It's an obligate wetlands plant, which simply means it's obliged to live in a wetlands. What that translates to um, is simply this. If you find skunk cabbage, you're in a wetland. You don't need to do a wetlands delineation. You know you're in a wetland. So if there's, if there's skunk cabbage, de facto, you've got a wetland. There are a few species that do that. Skunk cabbage is one of them. So right at the corner of a bean loop, we got a little wetland area right there. And it's thermogenic. Oh, this is so cool. The, the hood, and look at the diversity, the variety in the colors. Uh, here's a lot of green and less purple. So there's lots of, lots of, lots of diversity in the coloring of the hood. Um, but it's able to generate heat. So consider that it's, a, it's a, the hood uh, which protects the flower inside. And you can begin to see the flower peeking, the flowers peeking out of here on the left. Um, consider that it, it's, it's in a wetland area and it's going to, it, it's early, it's evolved to be early in the wildflower parade. So when it's coming up in late February, good probability that the wetland neither has snow or ice or both. So it has the capacity to generate heat and burns through and melts, look at that, how it melted the snow right around it, which is really great. And here's that flower. Well, actually these are a bunch of flowers. So inside the hood of a skunk cabbage is a round purple ball and orb, a globe. Um, and then it's got these, the yellow flowers all stuck to it. It actually looks like a coronavirus, doesn't it? So when you've seen drawings or, or um, uh, electron microscope photographs of a coronavirus. It doesn't look something like, I used to always say it was looked like a Sputnik satellite, but I think coronavirus is a, is a more timely metaphor. Uh, so the yellow things are the flowers and it's about 80 degrees in the center of that hood, which is really remarkable. But what that also does is the skunky smell uh, is diffused better with that um, with that high temperature. So because it's hot in there, you get, um, you get this, it's more of the chemicals are more volatile and you get um, the chemicals wafting out um, of the hood. And so the purple color for me is a dead giveaway, that purple, then that modeling, this is trying to look and smell like dead meat. This is, an, this is, this is a creature who's decomposing. And it smells like a creature that's decomposing and the, the heat helps send that chemical out. And so the flies and beetles who evolved to eat carrion find this smell irresistible and in they go looking into the hood. They crawl around the hood. Where's the dead and beat? <laughs> right? Don't find any. Fly out to the next one to find the dead meat there. And voila, the, the, the hood is pollinated. So it's a great pollination strategy. It's one of my favorite pollination strategies. Happens a lot. Actually, we're going to see it again in just a moment. So there's skunk cabbage um, in bloom right now. Uh, in fact, the green cabbage leaves have also popped already. So it's actually, it's a little bit late for skunk cabbage, but you can still see the hoods and the balls. So check those out. Next flower, um, actually just down the ravine loop from the skunk cabbage. 
uh, and it might be just a shade early for this one. So you got a little bit of time, but this one is going to be a little bit earlier than its cousin. And this one almost says its name. So it's got three petals behind it, three sepals. Sepals are the petal-like things that are sort of when the bud is closed. Those are the outside of the bud. So when the flower opens, you've got petals and sepals, and then three leaves. And if you look at the veins um, on the leaves, the veins are in parallel. Uh, they have some branches coming off, but they're essentially parallel. Well, for many, many, uh, for decades, actually, parallel veins and leaves uh, was a, one of the definitions of a lily. So here's a three-part lily. So many of you probably know that this is trillium. The three lily, the three-part lily, three of everything. Um, and uh, this is the red trillium. And red trillium is um, a little bit later than um, the skunk cabbage, uh, but one of the first of the wildflowers, the, the flower flowers to pop up. It's got a bunch of other names. I love these names. Uh, Wake Robin, which I'll talk about in a second. It wakes the Robin. Um, and then I don't know why they picked on Benjamin, but Stinking Benjamin is another one of its nicknames. Uh, because if you take a whip waff, you know, this guy, uh, yeah, it's got a little odor to it. So like the skunk cabbage and colored, not unlike the skunk cabbage, this is trying to get those same flies and beetles. So if they're frustrated by the skunk cabbage, they check out uh, the stinking Benjamin over here to see what's there. So lots of animals try to, you know, seduce and fool <laughs> those poor flies and beetles. So stinking Benjamin. John Burroughs is a nature writer who most people have forgotten about, a contemporary of Muir, um, of Teddy Roosevelt, and friends with both. He was a best-selling author uh, at the turn of the century, like 1900-ish. Uh, and he wrote a book called Wake Robin. It's one of, one of, one of his better-selling books. Um, and he wrote about the flower. With me, this flower is associated not merely with the awakening of the robin, for he has been awake for some weeks, but with the universal awakening and rehabilitation of nature, the universal awakening of nature. So there's Wake Robin, uh, which gave its name to uh, one of the best-selling books by, by John Burroughs. His writing is a little Victorian and archaic, but um, I, I do in invite you to check it out. Um, and again, uh, in 1900, he was probably a better known name than John Muir or as well known as John Muir. So his name, unfortunately, he didn't have legs. There we go. So the wake robin, I thought for years was named for the robin until I came across something recently that somebody alluded to saying, no, you know, it was named by the settlers uh, for the robin that came from Europe, the one that they knew. So, um, and actually the European robin was named for, uh, the American robin was named for the European robin. So when colonial, uh, when settlers from Europe came over, they began to import some of the names. And so um, they remembered a red-breasted bird um, in England called the robin. And they said, hey, we'll call this robin too. Um, so, um, so there's our robin and the British robin. The British robin uh, played a big role in Secret Garden. So you probably remember that. Um, and the American robin starred in Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins is set in London. She sings a spoonful of sugar. Um, and she has an Ameri a mechanical robin in a nest. Maybe some of you remember that. It's the American robin inexplicably in a nest in uh, a British tree. But, you know, it's Walt Disney and he, got, he gets to call the shots. So, um, but I was pursuing this a little bit more. Um, and here's the range of the American robin. So green is where the bird is seen 12 months of the year. And if you look at this map, here is Philadelphia right up in this corner of the green. So we get robins 12 months of the year, as you probably have noticed, uh, they don't migrate. They're not a sign of spring for Philadelphians. But look, if you live in the, um, in the Appalachian Mountains, for example, or upstate New York uh, or New England, uh, or of course, all of Canada, but here, um, this is where they did not see robins. Um, in the winter. And so a robin would be a sign of spring for them. So perhaps the wake robin was named by, by New Englanders, uh, New Yorkers, and, and that's how we got it today. But anyway, there's the wake robin. Wake robin has this cousin right here. Uh, beautiful flower for many people. It's probably their favorite spring wildflower of all. Um, and it looks just like the red trillium, except it's not 
the red color, bright, bright white, kind of like the blood root we saw earlier. And so no surprise, here is white trillium and it's got a great scientific name. So trillium is the genus name. So there actually are a surprising number of plants and animals that the genus name is the common name, rhinoceros, for example. Uh, my, my favorite example is gorilla. Um, the gorilla's scientific name is, right, the, the two words, genus and species, it's gorilla, gorilla. And there's a subspecies of gorilla, a lowlands gorilla. So a subspecies is a third name. So it's gorilla, gorilla, gorilla. Um, which I don't think happens too often. But Trillium grandiflorum, this, the gene, this species name refers to grand, big, showy flowers, the, the big, the grand flowers. So Trillium grandiflorum, red, white Trillium. Beautiful white flowers that have no smell, no smell at all. Because I think for me, if you're bright white like this, you're essentially such a signal, such a billboard for those pollinators who are starved for food that you don't need to smell. So just show those bright white petals and you're good to go. Look at the pollen falling off this thing. Isn't that great? Uh, no smell um, and then the liosome. So we have another example of a flower putting an liosome on its seeds so that the ants will carry it away and underground. So we have now a second species of trillium. Oh, the deer crave trillium. Uh, out uh, almost more than any other uh, flower. So deer actually love lilies. Lilies are a really, uh, it's, it's like in, in the, um, in the forest, they'll almost select the lilies over other things uh, and they'll select the, 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 de the trillium above other things. So if, if the forest is a salad bar, this is what they're going to first in the salad bar. Um, in fact, there are studies that I've done. They can predict the density of deer um, in a forest by the popular by the by the number of trillium that have been nibbled on. So there's a correlation, high correlation between browse and and deer density, um, and that's one of the, for me, conundrums. I'll take it, but it's a conundrum, and it's a happy conundrum that um, we do have an exclosure. We'll talk about our wildflower loop. We do have an exclosure where. Um, where um, the, the, we have a, an eight foot fence that keeps the deer out. Um, but uh, what the ravine loop is not, there's no exclosure for the ravine loop. And, and yet there they are, uh, there the, the trillium are. So um, not sure, but I know we'll take it that the, the deer thus far have let them be. It's really great news. So there's a third species um, of trillium on the property. And this one is really, is an oddball. So we, we have stands of both the red and the white. Um, and by the way, you often see the red first and the white later, and you rarely see the two together. So you're gonna see red, then you have to come back in a few weeks if you wanna see the white. So again, you have to do multiple trips uh, to see all the markers in the parade. Uh, you can't just get one-stop shopping is the bad news, um, except tonight uh, virtually. So I love this trillium, how it's got the three petals, right? The three sepals, it's got the three uh, leaves, but there's no stalk. And to a botanist, you call it a sessel. It's resting, it's sessel on top of the leaves. So the flower rests on the leaf. Um, and so this looks like an umbrella for toads. So toad shade trillium. There is one, count them, one flower of this uh, in the wildflower loop kind of have to know where to look. It's actually, it's only um, uh, and a couple of inches away from the trail. So if you know where in the trail you go, where, where you need to go to see it, it's not hard to find. I'm always terrified someone's gonna step on it. And I wonder why we have only one uh, sample of it, one specimen of it. And I'm, we've done many uh, wildflower plantings in, uh, the, in the wildflower loop over the, the years. And I wonder if this is a successful planting from one of our restoration work days. Um, and that's stuck, we'll take it. Uh, but for me, it's always, it's always a pleasure to see this and it's always a curiosity. People love this one. Um, very easy to tell from other wildflowers. Um, it's got those sort of nodding yellow uh, petals. So the flower faces down and opens a kind of a bell but it's got that modeling in the leaves, a modeling that reminded people of the back of a certain fish. 
So here we got the trout lily. So name for the modeling uh, that trout have on their backs. If you've seen trout, you might recognize that. Also called adder's tongue because both the uh, leaf and the petal look like the tongue, of, could look like the tongue of a snake if you wanted it to. Also called dog tooth violet, the dog teeth of this, it's not a violet, but dog tooth violet. Um, the dog tooth part is uh, a feature on the uh, rootstocks underground. So there's trout lily. And as you walk down the ravine loop, you will see as you're walking, um, let's say you're, so you're coming down the ravine loop and you make the left-hand turn, it's gonna be on your left past the skunk cabbage and it's gonna be in and around the trillium. Uh, and both the red and the white are near each other uh, at different times. But this you'll see the leaves coming up um, and you'll see lots of trout lily leaves and rarely yet, have we seen that many flowers? And here in the foreground, you can see there's that one flower. So there's a cute little story here, which is actually not unlike many of the other spring wallflowers. So you've got this rootstock that lives underground for the year. So the organism basically is the rootstock. Um, that's what's there uh, for five, 10, 20 years, right? Um, the plant itself that we see that we think is the organism is ephemeral. It's there for a few days, a few weeks, and then it's gone. When you come for a walk in the ravine loop in July, you will see no evidence of any of these wildflowers. They're essentially gone. So that's though the wonderful thing is that the, the rootstock is living underground. So what the wildflower is doing um, is it sends out that leaf. Um, it's photosynthesizing in the sun. And the leaf is sending... Um, that sugar down into the root to turn into starches to store for the next year. So when it's a young, just starting out trout lily, it sends up the one leaf, photosynthesizes, woodstock gets bigger, second year sends up one leaf, does the same thing third. It might take seven, eight, even 10 years for the rootstock to be big enough, for the flower to have the resources so that um, it can then send up, here you'll see, two leaves, two leaves here, and then a flower. So you'll see the one leafed version everywhere, and hard to tease out which of these two leaves belong to this one. But every time you see uh, a trout lily with, um, with a flower, it's got two leaves. So it's a very patient plant. It's going to wait seven, 10 years. So they're long lived then, right? The rootstocks are long lived. So it's going to wait a while, bide its time. And then um, it takes a lot of energy to make a flower. So they bide their time, right? Um, and they take their time, get big enough, and then they've got it. Uh, and this idea of, of energy, we're going to come back to that thought with a couple of other flowers. So um, as I walk the ravine loop, I see hot, literally hundreds of single leaf trilling, uh, trilling, uh, trout lilies. And I keep waiting for the one year where they're all big enough and they burst and it would look something like that, which was not taken at the Schuylkill Center, but I wish. So my fantasy is one year, this is what ravine loop will look like and won't that be great. Uh, and I hope that our, our flowers are able to grow enough every year to get big enough. So there's, there's trout lily. Here's a cute little wildflower. It's little is the operative word. Uh, it, this is not to scale, so it's hard to show the scale here, but it's a bright white flower. Again, like we've seen several times, but this one has lilac colored racing stripes through it, really beautiful light purple racing stripes. And look how that lilac even comes on the stamens that hold the pollen. So um, beautiful flower. Um, there's a flower behind it. So the one stem has a forks and has flowers on two flowers. And then there's two more buds so it can, it can bloom for a longer period of time. Look how it's got two leaves, right? When it pops up with the flower. Um, you could have called many flowers this one, but this is the name that's stuck to this guy. Beautiful flower, right? Spring beauty. So if I was going to say this is the one flower that's spring beauty, I might choose a different one, but that's okay. This is the one that gets spring beauty. Um, it is a beautiful, it's gorgeous, uh, but it's small, so it's hard to miss. Uh, and actually, as you're walking down Ravine Loop, before you make that left turn, you can actually see the first spring beauties um, on the descending trail on both sides. Uh, there's some, an early skunk cabbage or two also uh, before you make the left-hand turn. Then when you turn, you'll see some more. So check out Spring Beauty on the way down. Spring Beauty 
if you're a stickler for scientific names, Claytonia is the genus. There are other Claytonias, but named after a botanist, Clayton. Spring Beauty, really pretty flower. And then also in and amongst all these guys, you're going to find this, um, which is uh, underloved for a reason I'll show you in a moment. Um, and again, these flowers are probably no bigger than a dime, so not that big. Um, but compared to its clan, these flowers are huge, which is really funny. And you can see there's 10 petals and there are five pairs. So two, 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 right? So five sets of two uh, going around the circle. Um, and when I show you the name, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, star chickweed. So there's the star, of course, that it looks like in chickweed. Because yes, star chickweed is a cousin of the chickweed, the common chickweed that we pull out of our lawn. Um, this chickweed has tiny petals. That's sort of its signature as the petals are small, but star chickweed has uh, humongous petals compared to all the other members of the chickweed family. So um, the chickweed that we pull out of our lawns is uh, a, not a native wildflower to North America. Star chickweed, on the other hand, is a cousin. It's in that same grouping, but it's a native. So it's a native chickweed. So we let it be down at the ravine loop and look for it. Um, that this is sort of like, this is like advanced credit wildflower walks, if you can pick out the star chickweed um, uh, in and around uh, the spring beauties and the other guys. Um, so I'm an oddball. This is my favorite. I don't know why. I just love seeing this, this uh, leaf like this. Um, you know, not an obvious showy one, um, but as you walk, you'll see this long, almost fern-like leaf come out with leaf or actually stem with leaf, 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 sort of alternating like this. And look, there's the parallel, right? Uh, Lily's signature. Um, so it's again, it's, it's a member of the Lily family. Um, and if you lift it up, well, actually, let me tell you the name first. Solomon's seal is the name. Solomon named after King Solomon. I'll tell you about the seal in a second. Solomon's seal. And, um, but if you lift up, um, that stem to see what's underneath. You're going to get these cute little dangling bells. Um, they sell Solomon seal now in native plant sales and plant sales. They call it a native. It's actually, it's the giant Solomon seal. It's not the one that's here local. And I do have a concern with some uh, of the plant sales that even our own is that we're selling uh, varieties of them. And when you get a variety, like a named variety, um, of a, of a flower or even a tree, it's a clone of the one. So there's no genetic diversity. So the best thing is to have wild types, but that's a whole nother conversation for another day. Um, but nonetheless, um, the Solomon seal that you might see in uh, for sale at a garden store is not exactly the wild Solomon seal that you would see at the, at the Schuylkill Center uh, on, at the Ravine Loop. Um, but pairs of dangling bell-like flowers, not crazy colored. Oh, look, there's, they're very subtle white, but then that, that sort of that, that fringe of green. So a little bit of blending in. So it's not trying to be, um, not going obviously for like big pollinators like bumblebees um, and honeybees, right? But here's the seal part. So I remember now go back to, to ancient times when someone like a king sent an important document um, by courier to another kingdom. It was sent um, by horse, horseback, um, and the courier would put this, uh, you know, the letter in a pouch, but it was sealed with wax, and then the, the king's ring would seal it, and that was the seal of that king. Um, and that, of course, showed that the letter was never opened, right? Never tampered with. Um, somehow, this scar on the rootstock of a Solomon seal reminded some unknown botanist, uh, you know, decades, centuries ago um, uh, of King Solomon's seal. And so hence the name. But I do want to point out, this is really cool. What happens is uh, was, we've been talking about um, the rootstock uh, photosynthesis, uh, receiving the products of photosynthesis and then uh, getting bigger, right? So each year the, the rootstock would get a little bigger. What Solomon seal does is really awesome. So at the end of the Solomon seal rootstock, it sends up the next year's uh, leaf with its growth. And then that leaf does its thing and sends stuff back down again into the root. When it's done, the leaf falls off and it falls off leaving a scar like that. So these are the impressions of the previous year's leaves. So, so theoretically, if you dig up a Solomon seal, 
which we would never do. Uh, count back along the scars and you can guess the age uh, of the Solomon seal. Um, and if you are curious what King Solomon's seal might have looked like, there's a lot of apocryphal stories about it. Um, there's a lot of legends and mythology around King Solomon's seal um, about evil and good. Uh, he had two seals, one for evil, one for bad, it just, and one for good. Um, it gets crazy, but um, there's a, a piece of the legend is that essentially uh, he invented the Star of David. Um, so even though it's named Star of David, King Solomon is the inventor, and that was his seal. You don't quite see the Star of David there, uh, but you do, you do see the dots. But nonetheless, that's, that's the name. And growing not very far from the Solomon seal, and in fact, usually outnumbering the Solomon seal, is a flower that's going to annoy you because the leaves look just like Solomon seal. It's the, the stem with the leaves going, um, coming off, and then there's the parallel veins, right? Look, there's a fly sitting right here, by the way. But look how the leaves... Uh, I'm sorry, the flowers are not dangling bells. They're um, a plume of them at the end of the stem. So this guy is false Solomon's seal. So you've got Solomon's seal, and nearby you're going to find false Solomon's seal. When I was learning wildflowers and doing these kinds of walks, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there was a movement <laughs> among people who do these kinds of, you know, natural history kinds of things. Um, there was a movement that it was sort of not, what, not fair, not right, not nice, condescending to call something false. Why is it false? It's not false anything. It's a, it's a real flower. Why is it false? So there was an effort to nickname or rename this Solomon's Plume. Uh, but that never took. Actually, that's a great name, Solomon's Plume. But Solomon, of course, never wore a plume very much. But here's, named it, that name didn't stick. Uh, Fall Solomon Seal did. And here it is. Um, and if you look at the two side by side, you could begin to tease out the difference. I mean, the one obvious difference, if they're in flower, and they're not, they aren't always, right? So if you have young versions who don't yet have the resources to create flowers, it's going to be tough. So uh, false Solomon seal at the end, uh, Solomon seal, not true, but just plain old Solomon seal. There is a difference in color, which you'll sometimes see. There's a slightly almost bluish tinge. Um, Solomon seal always seems to me a little more fragile than false Solomon seal. But here's the, here's the kicker which I think you can see, because that it's hard to discern those two differences. Like what is, what is greener if you don't see the other one, right? Solomon seal typically has a straight-ish, it gets a little wavy in there, but it's kind of a straight-ish stem. But look at this one now, it zigs and it sags. So zig, make a leaf, zag, make a leaf, zig, make a leaf, zag, make a leaf, zig, do a leaf. So there you are. Uh, so if you see that zigzag pattern, ah, that's false. You got it. So, so do check that out when you're down there. So we have two versions of Solomon seal. So these are, that's the most of the best flowers. There are other things too that you're going to see along uh, the ravine loop. So what you want to do next is come up the trail uh, and get to the wildflower loop. And in the wildflower loop, uh, if you're walking down from Pollywog Pond, and um, you make a left, um, there's a wildflower sign. There's a sign that interprets our wildflowers. And just beyond that sign, if you look to your left, you're gonna see a really healthy stand of like, it's just big like this, right? And it's got a lot of small little yellow flowers, yellow-ish flowers, not really impressive flowers, not working hard to attract anything, right? Again, um, but this one, some might know this, uh, blue cohosh, cohosh. Good Indian name, right? Um, this is Algonquin Indians, um, and it means rough, which relates to the rootstock having a rough quality to it. There's a black cohosh and a blue cohosh, and just to confuse things, they're not even close cousins. Um, they're in two separate uh, families and even orders uh, botanically, but the name, the the common name, stuck. And I think that both are used medicinally. I think that's where the the black versus the view came in that they both were used uh, for herbal herbal medicine. Um, and again, there's the flowers, sort of yellowish greenish, so not working really hard to pollen to, to attract pollinators. So they obviously have got something worked out. I haven't figured it out yet. And they turn into these wonderful berries that are white and blue. 
but it's uh, here's um kind of an herbalist uh, drawing of them from the 19th century, and it's got lots of uses uh, in legend, but um it's got other names too. So papoose root is one of the names that um, settlers gave to it, and squaw root is another. Um, so what you get a sense from these two names is that the colonial settlers were looking at this plant and realizing that the Native Americans who were inhabiting this area um, had lots of uses for it. And if you look at the, these names, papoose and squaw, you could begin to guess what some of those uses might be. This is from WebMD. So even today, it uses for stimulating the uterus and starting labor, starting menstruation, stopping muscle spasms. It's a laxative. It treats colic, sore throat, cramps, hiccups, epilepsy, hysterics, inflammation of the uterus, infection of the female organs, right? pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, and joint conditions. So it's got a lot of things that it can do. So there's a, a thought that it must have estrogenic qualities to it. And that's where it helps with uh, uterine issues, uh, with menstruation, uh, with even childbirth. So, uh, so blue cohosh, widely used um, by Native Americans long before the settlers were here. And WebMD also says the roasted seeds are used as a coffee substitute. And given all the things it can do for you, I would hesitate to roast it and drink it as coffee. I would, I would shy away from that. Something that strong, I would, uh, actually coffee's pretty strong, isn't it? All right. Next flower down in the wildflower loop, and I'm realizing it's um, it's just eight o'clock, um, so I'm going to talk for a, just a few minutes more. So hang with me, and we're we're getting to the end of our walk. Um, I'm sure you know this one. This is also many people's favorite, in fact, because it's so showy and happy uh, and easy to spot. Um, it's got sort of um, green and brown, almost purplish striping to it, and if you pull um, that that hood back, you'll see um, the flower inside here. Um, and you might know this as Jack in the pulpit. And there's Jack happily sitting inside his pulpit. Uh, a really easy wildflower for people to see. And if you look again, here's one leaf coming up here, a second leaf coming up there. It does the two leaf thing as well. One leaf first, two leaf. Ah, but it's got a twist on that story because here's the male Jack in the pulpit on the left with one leaf. Here's the female on the right with two leaves. So here's a twist on the story. Not only does it take a lot of resources to make a flower and then seeds, but it takes more resources to make the female parts of the flower than it takes to make the male parts of the flower. Because the male part, you're just making pollen, you throw it out into the world, and then you're done. The female part, you need to then create seeds and fruit. So it takes a lot of resources. So what happens is younger Jack in the pulpits will all be male. The flowers only have the male parts in them until they get big enough and have the resources enough to send up two leaves and the, the, the flower switches and that year it's all female. And essentially it exhausts itself and the next year it goes back and it's male again. So you've got a male flower, then a female, and then a male uh, in three consecutive years. So um, that's a real interesting twist on the one leaf versus two leaf situation. And it turns uh, these bright red fruits. Turkeys love them. Wood thrushes love them. Lots of things. Deer love them. Lots of things eat the, uh, the fruit of the jack, jackfruits. That was my stupid pun. Next flower, uh, walking along, you'll see only a few of these. Doesn't quite, not in this profusion but it's really sweet Dutchman's breeches because someone thought that they looked like Dutchman's breeches, right? Um, and if you go back to um, in time, you know, the pantaloons, someone thought these were like pantaloons kind of hanging out uh, on the laundry line. Um, the genus name is Dicentra. Um, if you love your flowers, bleeding hearts are Dicentra as well. So it's a cousin of bleeding hearts. Uh, but there's a Dutch and breeches. Actually, it means two points, Dicentra, two points. And there's the two points here. There's actually not just those two points, but these two that come off the flower at the bottom. That's the two points they're really talking about. And Dutchman's breeches has a cousin not far away that see how the Dutchman's breeches are pointed. But this one has very similar leaves. The leaves are really sweet. They're very uh, cut up. They're, they're very, they're very fern-like. Um, but this one has rounded tops like a bleeding heart, but it's all white. And that's squirrel corn. So we've got Dutchman's breeches and squirrel corn. Now this one we don't have at the, this next one we don't have at the nature center. You may see this uh, around people plant this, but there's a pink version of squirrel corn. 
Uh, that's actually a different species, but a very close cousin, and they've given it the common name, turkey corn. So we don't have turkey corn at the Nature Center, but you probably have seen this uh, on your walks around other places. And then another classic that people love, um, this one, um, wow, I just love the colors you get from this one because you get multiple colors simultaneously, but that blue, just a gorgeous color when it opens up, just a happy thing. This is later in the parade too. Now we're getting almost done with the parade of wildflowers, Virginia bluebells, and Virginiana is its species name. Mertensia um, is the, the genus name. But what I love about this one is you get multiple colors. And we have great stands of Virginia bluebells in Ravine Loop. So you'll see lots of this. And actually, when you if you do the walk from the Ravine, I'm sorry, from the Wildflower Loop to the Ravine Loop, you'll see Virginia bluebells should accompany all the way along. They're all throughout uh, that stretch there, which is great. But what I love about it is you get like three colors in one sometimes. You get the blue when it's open and you get like a pink when the bud is closed. And then as the bud is thinking of opening, you get kind of a lilac in between. So you got like a light purple. So you've got pink, light purple, blue. Uh, so you get three colors in one and all three colors are happy and we'll take them. So this one is late April, like Earth Day into May. So we're coming to the end of the wildflower parade. And about the same time, um, you're gonna see this guy um, looks like um, a comet perhaps, but people thought, okay, these look like shooting stars. And so we have lots of shooting stars in the wildflower loop um, as you walk around. Uh, actually, we have great stands of, wildf of shooting stars, I'm sorry, right when you're looking at the blue cohosh, turn around and you'll see the shooting stars. And then they have plants that are near them, uh, interspersed with them, these clusters of uh, compound leaves, um, and then beautiful light blue flowers. And this is Jacob's Ladder. Uh, another biblical reference, um, early botanists thought that this compound leaf looked like a ladder and they hearkened back to um, Jacob in the Bible in the Old Testament falling asleep with a, a pillow as uh, a rock as a pillow. And he had a dream of angels going up and down a ladder going to heaven. So they christened that wildflower Jacob's ladder in honor of that. So I'll let you decide if you see a ladder in that when you go see it. Sweet flower. And then the last couple of flowers are a uh, several different members of this family that you can see. We have at least three different species uh, in this family. And this one uh, goes by the humdrum name, common blue violet. So it's not just the blue violet, it's the common blue violet. So you've got a lot of these accompanying you on your walk as you go from the ravine loop all the way, I'm sorry, from the wildflower loop down to the ravine loop. So they'll, they'll walk with you the whole time. You'll find them all the way through, which is great. And there's a second species of violet not far and interspersed among them, not as common uh, as the blue, but it's there. And so violets don't have to be violet. The violet family is huge. Viola uh, is the species. And this one is the Canada violet. Canadensis would be the species named Viola canadensis. So uh, white with yellow centers and then these purple veins uh, that's the Canada violet. Oh, Canada. Um, I love this one. It's my, my favorite violet of all the violets because it broke the rule. There's also actually a yellow violet that you can, that's even more rare at the Schuylkill Center, but you can find yellow violets as well. One more flower for you. Uh, you get this little umbrella guy, uh, makes a big stand. And when you go for a walk through the wildflower loop and you see a giant stand of all these little parasols, uh, that's a clonal colony. It's one organism. They just keep growing, that rootstock keeps going and it, they just keep popping up. So it's like a super organism on the bottom of the forest floor. And it's old, it's been there for a really long time, which is really cool. Um, and then you've got the flower. And again, one leaf parasol when it's not ready, two leaves when it's got the resources and time and in the crotch of the two, uh, of the two leaves, there's the flower. And so that's May apple, as I'm, I'm guessing many of you knew. Um, May apple was likely named by somebody from the South where it's an apple in May. Uh, the apple tends to be, um, tends to be ready for us in June. So, uh, but there you go. So you're not going to see a May apple in May. You'll see the May apple in June and May you'll see the flower. <laughs> um, books will tell you this is edible. The, the fruit is edible. Don't, um, so much of this flower is poisonous 
the the fruit is edible if you if you let it become super ripe and you don't eat the seed in it it's just so much work it's not worth it it's poisonous otherwise so i would just let it be uh, i'm not big on edible wild plants in part because there's so much danger associated with them but there's mayapple a really lovely flower um another nickname for it is american mandrake and when they call something mandrake you get a sense that it's got some medicinal properties as well so the root is used by Native Americans. Um, and these are really amazing uses. A purgative, an emetic, a liver cleanser, if you ever want your liver cleansed. And my favorite thing of all, worm expellent. If you ever need your worms expelled, <laughs> here you go. But also treated jaundice, constipation, hepatitis, fevers, and syphilis. So powerful thing, you gotta know what you're doing. It is poisonous, so be really careful, May apple. So for many people, these are, this is our, our sign of spring, right? For many of us, and these are the signs of springs we can name, a butterfly and a dandelion, but the butterfly is not native and neither is the, uh, that's a cabbage white, by the way, imported, and neither is a dandelion. So um, unfortunately, what we've got is just these wonderful wildflowers bursting out uh, in sequence in a parade starting right now we're already into the parade with um, the skunk cabbage already being up and bloodroot likely if it's not up now uh, any day now um, and then red trillium should be coming soon as maybe it's only as next week we'll try to keep you posted on facebook when we find things um, but um, emerson said it well in one of his poems the earth laughs in flowers uh, for me it's just such a happy sight to see um, it's impossible to have a down day. You know, nature is healing anyway. On a bad day, a walk in the, just green in a forest is healing, but a walk in a forest with these wildflowers, oh, it's, it's just perfect. So um, I want to thank you all for coming. Hope you, hope you